Um, we're so glad to have you here for our first Healthy Living with Mild Cognitive Impairment Education Series of 2023. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am Jennifer McAllister. I'm one of the program managers with the Alzheimer's Association Wisconsin chapter, and I will be one of your moderators today. So as you have uh, questions and comments, please put those in the chat, and uh, I'll be one of the people moderating those uh, comments as they come in. Um, this is really, <coughs> excuse me, this is really an interactive uh, education series. Um, so we, we welcome your um, participation. Uh, Bonnie Nuffinson is my um, partner and he, I'm sure, are, Bonnie, are you able to introduce yourself? There you are. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bonnie. I work at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We're so glad everyone is joining us today. I'm uh, just behind the scenes here trying to get our folks in Brown County online. Uh, so I'm going to step back and work on that. But I'm, I'm so glad you're all here with us yeah, this morning. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, as we get started, and everybody has um, met Dr. Chin now, and uh, we've gotten a little welcome from, from you, Dr. Chin. Thank you uh, so much for, for doing that. Um, a little bit of housekeeping as we get into today, what we'd like you to do is to mute yourself so that we can limit some of that background noise that might come from having so many of us on the call today. Um, and then as we have Q&A, please remember put all those in your chat. And then when we, can, when we open up the floor, if there's opportunity um, and you wanna say something, you can um, unmute yourself and, and we'll do things that way. So are there any, I don't believe Nate, there's any other housekeeping things we need to address. Um, so I'm gonna get right and uh, introduce our uh, speaker for today. Um, Dr. Kimberly Miller is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders and a research affiliate in the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute and Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Center. Research interests of hers include changes in language and aging and dementia, and interventions to maintain function in aging and dementia. So Dr. Miller, welcome back. We've had you on before and we're so glad that you're able to join us again as our first speaker of 2023. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to you. Wonderful, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. This is really a highlight of my year to be able to talk with you. Um, my name is Kimberly Mueller, as um, Jennifer said, <clears throat> and um, I'm a speech and language pathologist and so a speech therapist. And uh, I was a speech therapist for a long time before I became a researcher. So um, I'm so excited to talk about this uh, topic about keeping your brain active, um, especially from the side of communication, speech and language and communicating with others. That's something that we want to maintain um, throughout our lives uh, because social interaction is so important for our well-being. And so keeping our brains active is also going to be keeping our ability to communicate with each other and maintain our relationships um, throughout our lives. And so it's such an important topic, as Dr. Chin said. So I'm going to talk today about what is cognitively stimulating activity and just a reminder that cognitive means memory and thinking. So every time we say cognition, cognitive, we're talking about memory and thinking. And we'll talk about what it is and why the research really is getting better and better as time goes on. 
Um, we'll also do some activities and I'll talk about um, what's behind these activities that we're doing and what is it that's really engaging your brain and different parts of your brain. And then uh, of course, time for questions and answers. I'm gonna be watching uh, the chat as we go and uh, making sure that we uh, that I get all your questions answered if possible. Okay, so uh, the concept of, of this is backed by neuroplasticity. And so I think, you know, many of you have heard this term before, and neuroplasticity is something that occurs throughout our lives. And it means that the brain is plastic and the brain can change. And so you can learn new things um, and you can uh, expand your knowledge over your lifetime because of neuroplasticity. Um, but there are some keys to that plasticity, uh, especially as we get older, it's uh, a little bit, it requires a little bit more work to build new connections in the brain. And that work is rooted in repetition. And so the more you do something over and over, the more these new connections um, build and stay strong. And so when people say use it or lose it, that's what we're talking about. So if you stop engaging a part of your brain, let's say, um, math skills, for example, if you stop engaging that part of your brain, then those connections between those neurons in the brain, they start to fall away or they start to become weaker over time. It's just like muscles in our body. And so repetition is extremely important. And experience. Um, so experiencing things like what you're doing right now. So you're coming to these talks kind of regularly. And the more you do that, the more your brain is gonna change. So the more experiences we have and the more repetition we have, the more the brain changes. And so this picture on the right here are two brain cells that are communicating with each other. And this is where these connections form. So from one cell to the, to the next, when they communicate, those, those um, networks start to strengthen over time. So I'm going to show you a video that explains this concept a little more just to back myself up so that you, are, you leave here becoming a firm believer in neuroplasticity. Can you hear the sound? Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic, hence neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road it becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, 
You have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. All right, so that was a very good explanation. And um, I want to pause there just to see if there are any questions. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances... Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, any thoughts or questions um, about neuroplasticity that came up when you watched that video? Okay, well, um, why don't you think about that? And if, if questions come up as we keep going, um, just write them down or think about them and um, I'll answer them later. So cognitively stimulating activities, I'm gonna talk more specifically about what that means. Before we do that, um, I want to ask you to do a task while you're sitting there um, this is called a memory palace, or a method of loci is another word for it. And this is uh, one strategy for remembering a list. And I think a list is something we all need to remember for one reason or another. And the thing that comes to mind most is a shopping list. And um, so... This is a technique to remember a list. And so what you do is you visualize a house or a palace in your mind, and you place the items of the list in different locations in the house. So you try to see the object in a location, and then you move to another room and you put the next object in the other room and so on. And so this is a strategy for visualizing and remembering a list. So I'm gonna ask you to practice the strategy with a short list so that you get the hang of what this is talking about. So here is the list, and I'll ask you not to write these things down um, because we're trying to practice keeping it in our minds. And so, what you'll do is picture this house and then picture an apple in a location in the house. It could be your house if you want. And then picture a gallon of milk in a different location, a bar of soap in another location, and some pencils. So just take a minute to solidify those things in your mind if you can in different rooms of the house. All right, so the list is apple, milk, soap, and pencils. So try to keep those objects in your mind and in that, that mental um, memory palace. I'm gonna ask you about them again a couple more times. Okay. So back to our topic, what are cognitively stimulating activities? They're activities that challenge a person's ability to think. And so I saw in the chat, several of you used the word challenge. I try to do something challenging so that I can build the skills. So maybe you don't just read a book, but you read about a topic that's challenging or um, Sherry's example of kind of making herself get lost so that she can practice not panicking and practice um, that challenge of finding her way. And so that is what a cognitively stimulating activity is. 
So crossword puzzles are one example. For some reason, the news media loves to hone in on crossword puzzles, but it's just one small example. And if you're somebody who has done them your whole life and you're very good at them, then maybe a different puzzle would be more challenging. And that's the idea. Working from plans, doing woodwork activities, building something, building a garden, planting a garden or planning a garden. These are, we think of them as more physical, but they really are cognitively challenging. And I saw someone plays the tuba and I saw um, Jennifer or heard Jennifer talk about the flute. Playing a musical instrument is uh, one of the things that is very, very good for your brain because it involves several things, physical activity, fine motor skills, um, as well as engaging your brain. And so there's a question in the chat about this. If you haven't done something for a while, like play the flute and then take it up again, does your brain renew the old pathways or develop new ones or both? That's such a good question. And so I think that what it will do is renew some new, some old pathways that are still there. Because I think if you, if you picked up the flute, if you played it long enough when you were younger, you would kind of know what to do. And that's not the case for someone who's never played the flute. So that's uh, evidence for those pathways are still there. But then if you try to play a song, out the way it used to. And so that's an example of the pathway being weaker. And so by renewing it, you're going to renew those pathways. A lot of times it's going to be in the same regions of the brain. So um, part of our right side of our brain is really wired for music. And so it's going to strengthen pathways from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere. And um, it's, it's just fascinating about music. The other thing about playing an instrument is that it requires that repetitive practice. And when you repeat something over and over and over, it becomes a habit. And when you think about uh, memory changes to people who are showing um, changes to memory that is outside of what they uh, want or expect. One thing that does stay stable, even if you're showing a change in memory, is skills and habits like that. And so the more you can build skills and habits, things like that become automatic, the stronger those memories are going to remain, the longer they'll remain in your brain. Okay, so I talked and talked. So now picture that memory palace and that path you made with the different objects in the different locations. And what were the four words on the list? Apple, milk, soap, and pencils. Excellent. So that was apple and soap and pencils. I think there, there is one more. Milk. Thank you. Okay, milk. Did everyone uh, did, did everyone recall some of those too? And I think more than did you recall them is were you able to sort of see them in this memory palace is another really important question. So I'll ask you to do it again. Just think about those four objects in those different locations in a house and hold them in your mind in that memory palace. Kathy had a different strategy, which we will also talk about, which is a mnemonic device. So a mnemonic device is taking the first letter, um, wait, let's see, I remembered maps, just the initials. Can you say more about that, Kathy? taking the first uh, initials of the words and making a word out of them. So maps. I it just was... use, I just use the initials. 
because I am a consummate list maker and I totally admit that I don't rely, rely on my brain to remember stuff. So that's why I use the initials. Love it. That's still a memory strategy still. And besides and, that, all four of those things belong in the kitchen. So yes, that's true. <laughs> you could picture them all in the refrigerator or in a drawer. So that's another strategy. Thank you. All right. Okay, so about the evidence uh, that Dr. Chin was mentioning and that I'm mentioning, um, there are things that are called observational studies where we just watch people over time. We don't intervene. We don't ask them to do anything, but we watch them and we have them come and do memory tests every year, every couple years. Some of you on the call may be in a study like that where you come in and you get testing and at the same time that we do that testing, we ask questions about cognitive activity. So how often do you play games like chess or bridge or knowledge games like Wordle or words with friends? How often do you do puzzles like crosswords, acrostics, Sudoku? How often do you do other kinds of cognitive activity like artwork and crafting? And then how often do you do even more cognitive activity that has a social component like leading discussions, teaching, um, attending discussions? So those are the kinds of questions that you get asked if you're in one of these uh, observational longitudinal studies looking at people over time. And there's just so much evidence and it just keeps coming out more and more and more, especially as understanding Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementia becomes a priority, more and more studies have popped up and do this kind of work. And so this is an older study back in 2002, and it's really, you know, one of those seminal studies where uh, the Catholic nuns, so the nuns study, which you may have heard about, some, there was a site here in Wisconsin, uh, observed Catholic nuns and priests and brothers um, for a period of time. And the nice, wonderful thing about this study is that they all live in kind of a controlled environment. So they're not doing things that differently from one another, um, like in terms of traveling or lifestyle. So it's kind of similar, but within that lifestyle, some people engage in more cognitively stimulating activities than others. And so that's what they looked at. And they found that those nuns and priests and brothers who reported doing more uh, stimulating cognitive activity showed this reduced risk of developing dementia at the end of the study. So that's a really important study that set the stage for this work. A more recent study in 2019 also had a large number of people. In this case, it was just women. They were studying women for other reasons like heart disease but they also were looking at cognition and um, also looking at cognitive activity. So they asked those same questions. How often do you play games with other people? How often do you do crafts and artwork with other people? How about woodworking? All these different kinds of cognitive activities. Do you go to clubs like the Lions Club or a club or a meeting like this one? How often do you read books? So these were the kinds of questions that the, the women were asked over time. And women who engaged in more cognitive activity in their midlife had another 33% reduced risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So more uh, and more benefit of uh, cognitive activity being shown just by watching people, not putting them on 
uh, uh, a regimen. There are some drawbacks to this kind of study, though, because maybe the people who do these kinds of activities also do other things. Maybe they also exercise and they eat healthy. Maybe they just tend to do a lot of healthy behaviors. And so it's very difficult to extract what was the important ingredient that prevented them from having dementia. And so that's why we need more programs that actually put people on a regimen of cognitively stimulating activities and put people on a different regimen and then see <laughs> if the cognitive activity really helped. Before I get into that kind, I just wanna talk about a study that was done right here in Wisconsin, uh, a study that I'm part of, the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention. I'm part of it as a researcher, not a participant, but um, many of you, or you probably know someone in Wisconsin who's part of this study. And so these are healthy individuals who have a risk of developing Alzheimer's disease because they had a family member who had it. And so once again, we see that same pattern that people who reported playing games like checkers and crosswords and other puzzles tended to have just better scores on the memory tests overall. Also in this same study, there was this correlation between people who played these games and activities and the amount of brain volume in really important regions for memory, regions of the brain. And so the blue bar here shows people who played frequent games and frequent cognitive activities. And the red one is people who reported infrequent activity. And then on this left side, this is how much brain volume. So how much brain tissue, and to, to translate that back to the video we saw, how many pathways in the brain are existing to make that brain boosted. And the people in the blue bar who did a lot of cognitively, active, cognitively engaging activity really are showing just this increase in brain volume. So that's sort of more objective correlational evidence. But then when we move to, okay, let's put people on, a, put people on an activity, uh, an intervention where somebody is guiding them and telling them what to do and controlling it, um, we see the same kinds of patterns again. So this is a study of healthy older adults between the ages of 60 and 90. And I love this study because it's so interesting for people, like many of us on this call would want to learn um, quilting or would want to learn photography. Um, and so kind of picking activities instead of just brain games on a computer or something that might not be that interesting and picking things that are interesting and that we might actually stick with is such an important aspect. And so um, there was a quilting group in the study, a photography group, and then a group that got both of these things. And then a control group who uh, just had some social engagement with each other, but didn't do any kind of structured learning. And it was a lot of work, 16 hours a week of getting trained in these things. And so uh, this is the photography group in the red bar. And the photography group just by itself, for some reason, did really, really well on their memory after receiving that intervention. And, you know, it's, it's curious to think about why the photography group, as well as the dual condition group, that one that got both, did so much better than the control group. Um, but maybe, you know, operating a camera um, has a little bit more complicated facts to it or something. I'm not sure why, 
Um, but either way, you can see still that the quilting group did better than the placebo group. So uh, this is just great evidence for learning a new thing um, to boost your memory. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Kathy is suggesting maybe there's more body movement with the photography group. Maybe they got outside in nature. Maybe they moved around more. Maybe their fine motor skills were used in a different way than they were used to. Um, thank you so much. And Bonnie, just in the chat, if you want to take a look, she defined what an observational study is and what are the benefits. Thank you so much, Bonnie. So this is um, another study that put people on an intervention and watched them for a long time afterwards. And this is again, uh, healthy older adults, 65 to 94. And this had 10 sessions of training on memory and reasoning and speed of processing. So the training on memory was stuff like what we did with the memory palace or what Kathy did with the mnemonic device of kind of coming up with an acronym. Um, and then the speed of processing was done using one of the computerized brain games like Lumosity that you hear about on NPR and other um, advertisements. And it's where you sit at a computer and you kind of play these brain games that sort of challenge your brain in a different way. people who uh, did the cognitive training, um, you won't be surprised, but they basically did better than, uh, um, and the thing they did the best on was speed of processing. And that's one of the things that slows in normal aging. We just get a little bit slower in how we take in information. And so this kind of study was helpful in speed of processing. Um, it's not a great um, piece of evidence though for buying a subscription to Lumosity or other computerized brain games because they also got a lot of other one-on-one -on -one contact. And so we can't really separate out if it was the brain game. And also what evidence really shows about the brain game is that you get better at the game itself but you don't necessarily translate that skill into other aspects of remembering. And so it's very isolated, that kind of task. I think they're good though, if it's something you like to do and you wanna keep doing it because it's definitely engaging your brain. But if it's something that, if the thought of it kind of makes you roll your eyes sitting there and playing a brain game on a computer, then I wouldn't, recommend that you spend the money on something like that. But you might have more questions about that later. So I'll definitely talk about that a little bit more. So this is uh, the same uh, computerized brain game. This is just a picture of that. All right, thinking back now to the memory palace. And this time I'm gonna ask you to remember the words and Maybe write them in the chat if you remember them. What four words are we talking about? Good question. So do you remember the four words that I asked you to put in the memory palace in the beginning? Oh, I see, I wasn't here in the very beginning. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. I had a class, so I was there lost. There we go. There. That makes sense then. Okay. So the I'll tell you what. Milk, soap. To put these objects in your mind, visualize them and put them in different rooms in a house or different locations in a room. So you might even, as Kathy mentioned, you might even picture an apple where you normally keep apples in your kitchen. 
and picture the milk where you normally keep milk and kind of visualize yourself grabbing those items. All right, we're gonna move on again. So those words again were apple, milk, soap, and pencils. So try to keep them in mind. Other studies, I'm just giving you a list right now that show kind of the same thing that we're talking about are with a dance training study, an acting and singing training study, computerized training plus music lessons on top of it, um, training on how to use an iPad. Um, either maintaining memory or of getting better at memory. So the message behind this is to keep your brain active, choose activities that you want to do. And um, just as the question in the chat, revisit things that you used to do because some of that pathway is still there. And so if you revisit, it's going to be easier to relearn, but it really, really requires a lot of repetition. So uh, someone else mentioned this in the chat, that cognitive activities that have a social component are really giving you a double bang for your buck. So we know also that social activity, engaging with other people, is very good for our brains and for longevity, living a long life. And so combining the two seems to be extremely beneficial. Some of those studies that I talked about playing games, they're playing games with other people. So there's a really important component to that. And then if you can combine something with physical activity, which we absolutely know uh, boosts your brain function, then we have a three for one. So an example of that is dance classes where you're learning a new step. You have to think about it, you have to remember it, you have to use your body and you're with someone else and others. So it's a triple whammy for you. Now, another thing um, about both getting older uh, in a typical way, but then also, um, also in people who are facing kind of memory changes that are outside of typical. One thing that we can rely on for quite a while is our long-term memories. They're stored in a different part of the brain that is affected when you have early memory loss. They're stored in a completely different part of the brain. And so that might be why it's easier for you to think about when you were in your 20s or 30s or 20 years ago, you can remember some details from back then, but it might be harder to remember a list of words, for example, or remember what happened yesterday. And so one thing with cognitively stimulating activity is taking advantage of those long-term memories and doing activities that revolve around our long-term memories. And there's a name for that, which is called reminiscence. Um, we definitely like to reminisce in our lives in general, but this is a specific therapy type called reminiscence therapy. And it's cognitive stimulation around older long-term memories. And there's really strong evidence for cognitive stimulation based in reminiscence as a way of maintaining thinking skills. And we see this across the lifespan. We also see it across the spectrum of cognitive decline in people. And so it's a really important um, thing to think about, especially if you're a caregiver for someone who's showing real memory declines, it can be a really wonderful way to re-engage with them about something that is salient and important to them. 
So right here, I have a website that is called archives.gov. And so it's the National Archives. And in that website, there are thousands of pictures from any time period that you can um, print out, you can download them, you can just look through them and have a conversation around these activities, these older memories that people may have. So here's one example. And uh, just for our activity right now, I'm wondering if any of you recognize um, who this is in the picture and maybe what this scene is describing. Hello, I'm on my computer. I'm in here. It's Martin Luther King. Thank you so much. It's Martin Luther King. That's exactly right. What else? What is this scene kind of showing us? The port. The port. Can you say more about the port. that? Support. 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 Thank you so much. Yes, that's a wonderful word to use. Support. What else? Unity. Unity. Beautiful. Interaction. Interaction. Right. Emotion. Emotion. Thank you so much for this. What else? Hope. Right. Hope. Does anyone um, on the chat or in the in the call remember kind of this time period and what was going on? Sure do. Very much a time of unrest. Right. And uh, Teresa says Stokey Carmichael is also there. So you're recognizing yeah. other people as well. All right, I'm going to show you another picture and see what words come up or what memories come up or what thoughts come up. Okay, so the first question here is, um, does anyone recognize this person? Do they know who Audrey they Hepburn. Wonderful. Thank you beat you. me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody beat everybody with that one. That was very quick. Breakfast um, at Tiffany's. <laughs> yes, even more detail. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Cigarette holder. That's right. She's holding okay, a cigarette. Okay, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Anne said, okay, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone remember what this movie is about? Isn't it a little bit about rags to riches where she, <clears throat> she has, um, she finds this guy. I can't remember it that well, but sounds seems to me like that was part of what it was. Thank you so much. And um, how we go lightly. What was that? Holly go lightly. Holly go lightly. That was her name. Thank you. Did that take place in the fifties? Anyone know the answer? Did that take place in the 50s? 60s. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In the 60s, exactly. In the uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed that, huh? It was in the 60s. Oh, in the 60s. Yep, so sure. close. All right, coming back now. What were the four words on the list? And Kathy knows yeah. the exact year, by the way, 1961. All right. Four apple, words on the list. Go ahead. Apple, milk, uh, something, and uh, pencils. Oh, Thank soap you. and pencils. Soap. 
Apple milk soap and pencils, yeah. Excellent. How's everyone else doing with that list? And maybe even more than the list, how are you doing about visualizing the objects? Is that helping? Or what, what aspect of this is helping is another question. So I'm going to say the words again. So it's apple, milk, soap, and pencils. For me, it was easy because they're all in the, my kitchen. That's right. <laughs> and I knew where they were. That's exactly right. I could envision the uh, everything. That's fantastic. So um, Teresa says, placing them in different rooms works for her. And Susan says, memorizing according to a location and visualizing is what's helping. And um, Sherry said, I knew something was in the fridge, but couldn't remember what it was. So we, it, it really takes a lot of practice to be able to use visualization. And also you should note, it's not for everyone. So some people don't have that tendency to be able to visualize things in their brain. So it's just one strategy, whereas the other wonderful strategy is um, uh, the mnemonic device. So thinking about the first initial of each word that you need to remember. I did, that, I did that with parachute. I could not. I, I looked at the, at the parachute what it was but I could not get it out and uh, and so I yeah and so I I and I remembered P hmm. uh, and I also remembered shoot and so I put the two of them together fantastic yes that's an example of giving yourself a cue of that first letter and sometimes it just comes back to you all right I'm going to move on to another picture <laughs> so 50s. the 50s probably yes and what this picture says if you can't see it it says you mean a woman can open it and Ooh. so <laughs> so the first question was around what time frame is this picture think about that and anyone make out what she's holding Del Monte ketchup. Del Monte ketchup, exactly. Uh, twist top caps, probably. That's right. Twist top caps back then. Glass bottles. Mm -hmm. That's oh. right. So noticing like what, what, what cues are in this picture that make you think about the 50s? How did you know it was the 50s? And so you said a few things such as the glass bottle, the twist cap. What the else? Hairstyle. I looked at her hairstyle. Yes, her hairstyle, maybe her clothes even. And what do you think about the message at the bottom? <laughs> The, the caption. The <laughs> caption. That's right. The caption. You mean you can do it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. One more. So what is this ad for? Camel service. service. <laughs> yeah. What has this changed? Yeah. What has changed about this message? What the message says is, and I'm going to ask someone on the chat to kind of chime in if you can. The message says, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And so does anyone remember a time when that was the message that yes. these doctors smoke cigarettes and it's all okay? I do. I do. I come from, and I come from New York City. And in Manhattan, there were great big, uh, uh, oh, I don't know what you call it, advertisements up in the ceiling on the on the in the sky 
about smoking a cigarette and there was always somebody smoking the cigarette. That was one thing that I remembered. And, and also my father was a physician oh. and he did smoke camels and, <laughs> and before and before camels and, and all other cigarettes were, uh, were abused, he stopped smoking. And he put a pack of cigarettes in one of his uh, cabinets so that we could know that in the event that he had to start smoking again, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a pack of cigarettes there for him. But I tell you, he drove us nuts because we were all smokers and he, he had stopped. And He was ahead of his time, right? He was definitely ahead of his time, yes. He was he was a very good physician who stopped smoking. Yes. And Dr. Chin says, and this is true, and um, <laughs> I think I even remember this, Dr. Chin, but I was told doctors smoked in the hospital between seeing patients back in the day. When I say I think I remember it, I think I remember like seeing it <laughs> firsthand. <laughs> so that was definitely a thing. Um I don't know your first name, but I remember airlines giving passengers complimentary small packs of cigarettes. Can you believe this? Oh, no. And then <laughs> Kathy says, ha ha, camel straights, no filters. No. Uh, but there wasn't as many chemicals back, to, back then. That's possible. But still, the companies were hiding. Uh, I hate to admit right? to but um, as a nurse, we used to smoke in the back room of the ICU at Methodist. <laughs> yep. Yep. Can you believe that? Yes, we I, did. You. <laughs> yep. I had my first. I had my first baby here in Madison in uh, 1950, and my um, uh, obstetrician was an excellent person. But I asked him one time, "Do I have to stop smoking?" And he said, no, you don't have to stop smoking because having a baby is, is stressful enough. You don't want to stop smoking and then have more stress. Yeah, yeah. I think that definitely was a message that was going on. And, you know, the dangers just weren't as well articulated and well known. But thankfully, we know better now. Um, so another place that we can grab... Uh, pictures from, which can make things even more relevant to those of us who, and I say us, but I'm also from New York City, but from those of you who are from Wisconsin and spent your whole lives here, this is another great resource, is the Wisconsin Historical Society. And uh, somebody recognizes this already, Goldman's Counter. Um, and so this is 10th Street and Mitchell Avenue. And what city is this? Can I get someone on the chat to say it? Type it in. Milwaukee. Thank you, Cindy. Yes, Milwaukee. And, you know, thinking about what memories do you have of visiting the city in Milwaukee? Do you remember, you know, what, what it looked like back then compared to what it looks like now? Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question. What street is this? State Street. Incredible. Yeah, Capitol Theater. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Orpheum, you can see just the... Oh, yeah. So uh, people know this because they're looking at these other landmarks. And so... You know, this is a very busy picture and looking at these details of the picture and describing them, this is all part of the cognitively stimulating activity and having a conversation and thinking about answers to questions is, can be very cognitively stimulating. And when they're rooted in our long-term memories, it can be really successful as well. So I, I fibbed and I said, you have um, one more, but I'm going to give you just one more. <laughs> so here is a menu from a Madison restaurant that was on State, State Street. 
It was called Bittersweet Beginnings. And I don't know if you can make out the prices, but OMG. Yeah, right. So there's garlic bread for that's topped with a mixture of cheeses for a dollar thirty, soup for a dollar thirty-five. And then if you really want to go all out and get eggs benedict, it's two dollars and fifty cents. So roughly <laughs> what been... year do you think this? menu is from based on those prices really think about it in the chat if you can chime in 1960 i'd say at least back then i don't know yeah let's What's hear my all guess? guesses 1962 Any other guesses? Can you remember when? Um, can you remember when an omelet was only like two dollars? Joe was saying maybe it was nineteen fifty nine. Think I, did I? I don't even think I wrote it down. I think I, it. <laughs> I said nineteen sixty, so I'll stick with that. Yeah, you'll stick with that. I think. Um, if anybody has Google on them and can look this up, but I think it was around 1972, something like that, or 1967, one of those. So wow. in the 60s and 70s is where this is from. Wow. I know. And now an omelet would probably cost nine, 10 more dollars on State Street. Maybe I'm being optimistic. Maybe it's more like 12. Yeah. Okay, so here are some resources um, for where I got those kinds of pictures and uh, just such a great activity. And also, if you're caring for someone who might be getting anxious at home, let's say, um, just anxious because of the time of day or anxious for, you know, no particular reason they can articulate, sometimes pulling up this kind of picture and talking about it can really just center someone and bring them back by taking advantage of that long-term memory that is still stable in the mind. One more time now, what were the four words on the list? Try to picture them in the house or picture them in the refrigerator. Apple and milk. Apple's milk. So soap and pencils yeah yeah wonderful apple milk soap and pencils mm -hmm. fantastic so this is a way of really challenging yourself um Writing lists is such an important strategy, and I'm not advocating that you stop writing lists. Definitely not. Um, using as many supports as you can to help remember, and as we all need supports because there's so much information coming at us all the time. So writing lists is a really important strategy and putting things on the calendar and all of that. But if you wanna to try to really challenge yourself, you know, you could try to memorize a short list like this, and maybe you have the list in your back pocket somewhere. And when you get to the store, you try to do that visualization and see if you can rely on just your memory. And then if you can't, you can pull out the list from your back pocket. All right, I'm going to just list a few more ideas, but then I really want to hear your questions. If I can help at all, I will. Um, just a bunch of other ideas. And I guarantee you, if you have an idea um, of something, it's probably a cognitively stimulating activity. You know, if it's something that would engage your brain in a different way than you're used to, then it is cognitively stimulating. Um, sometimes people ask, like, what about watching TV? You know, is that cognitively stimulating? And it is to a point if you're learning a new thing or you're 
you know, watching a new episode of a show and you're, you know, really working at engaging in that. But the the downside is it doesn't involve other people and it doesn't involve any kind of activity of your body. And so that's a drawback to watching TV, but it's certainly not um, a bad thing. Um, and depending on what you're watching, you can really learn a lot. So, um, but thinking about it in a different way where you're engaging your social skills and your body uh, is really key, I think. So um, here's some more websites for help. I'm just gonna leave this list up um, and I'm gonna open it up for questions now. So one question I see is, are there any suggestions on how to remember a series of numbers? So that's really different um, because it's a little bit harder to use visualization for something like that. Um, and so one thing that I demonstrated with you today, in addition to the visualization for the list of words, were two other strategies that are built into that. So one was repetition. So I kept coming back to it. I kept saying the words over and over. I kept asking you to try to recall them. And so that's repetition. Um, another thing I was doing was spacing the time out between when I was asking you to recall them. And that's a strategy called spaced retrieval. So you kind of start with really small intervals of trying to memorize and then recall, and then you get wider and wider in terms of the time. So remembering numbers, a string of numbers, let's say you want to remember a phone number, right? So that's seven digits. So the way to do it is just repetition, repetition, repetition. And Having someone with you to help you kind of <clears throat> work through that in increasing time intervals is really helpful. But another thing, if you're trying to remember a phone number, you might want to break it apart. And so work on the first three numbers first. And so repetition, repetition, you could set a timer. And then when the timer goes off, try to re remember it again, and then so on. And then remember the second set, and then you have the two sets together. So that's another strategy. One thing I wanted to expand upon um, with the Dementia Friendly Initiative that I talked about is in the state of Wisconsin, um, each of our aging and disability resource centers, so our ADRCs, have dementia care specialists. Uh, we might call them DCSs for short. Um, our uh, DCSs in um, Rock County, Dodge County, and Brown County are our folks hosting our community sites uh, for today. And part of their job is also uh, to help with dementia-friendly initiatives, to help make sure the ADRCs are dementia-friendly, and then to take that out into the community. And um, Karen or uh, Rob, do either of you wanna say more about that since we have you right on here? <laughs> Um, yeah, so just like Bonnie was saying, you know, it is an initi initiative that is going on in Wisconsin and um, in Dodge County, I have started uh, doing more uh, dementia friendly uh, business training, um, as well as um, dementia friends, um, which is more of a individual based um, commitment. Um, and just education, education, and lots of education. Um, and, and starting really with those basics of, of what, is, what is dementia? Um, you know, what is myocognitive impairment? Um, because those, those are the things people need to understand to begin with mm -hmm. um, and, and build off of. Um, and so, you know, that's something that as dementia care specialists across the, the, the state, um, we're really focused on. It's a, um, 
a 30 to an hour um, training. Um, there's no cost. The business has to, um, you know, want to do it. Um, you know, to be committed to not just doing that training, but to continue to learn, um, to to build off of that foundation that we're starting with that training, um, and and make those small changes that can really make a big difference. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Rob. Karen, is there anything else you want to add or talk about uh, from Rock County? Well, sure. Just um, making sure that, that, you know, kind of expanding on that as well, that we also support and educate folks with a diagnosis as well as their family caregivers, um, as well as the general public. So it expands to professional paid caregivers as well. Um, providing education and support to them to better serve the communities, the you know the folks that they're serving, um, and so it, it and and we're now in almost all 65 counties plus tribal communities, so it is truly the entire state, um, and it, there is nothing like it any other place in the United States. So we're very lucky. Um, in addition to the UW system. Um, of research and memory clinics to, to have that type of program available for folks. And if you need to connect with the ADRC and the dementia care specialist in your county, um, you know, please do so. Um, when you have questions, you need further support, you're looking for a support group, a memory cafe, um, upcoming events like what we're doing here in this MCI series, um, contact us please get in touch with us so that we can um, we can assist you with, with what it is that, that you're looking for. Thank you so much, Karen. So we're getting close to the end of our time together. We've had such a lively discussion today. It's been wonderful. And um, Kim, thank you so much for everything you shared. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, I wanna go ahead and uh, start to wrap us up. Uh, once again, just a pleasure to be with all of you in this space this morning and spend this time together. Um, brings such joy to my heart that we can all come together and uh, share strategies for success and, and learn great information. I feel like I should start to like play the piano again or something now. Um, I don't have one here or a keyboard, but you never know. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a couple things as uh, we wrap up. We uh, will be having three other sessions this year. Many of you registered for them um, all at once. So uh, we will send you a reminder email as it gets closer. Um, so you have the link again. If you're at your um, the community sites, thank you so much for coming and joining us in person. If you live in or near Rock, um, Jefferson, Dodge, or Brown County, and you'd want to join them in person, please consider doing so. Um, then uh, from there, you could join in person if you want. You can get the information from our website of how to register to come in person there. And uh, Jennifer, do you want to um, briefly uh, talk about living well with chronic condition conditions, the next session coming up? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Bonnie. Living Well with Chronic Conditions is an evidence-based program that we uh, provide through the Alzheimer's Association in partnership with the Wisconsin Institute of Healthy Aging and um, actually Milwaukee County's uh, uh, Aging Services. So uh, it's a uh, program that is open up to, opened up to anyone who is experiencing mild cognitive impairment. Um, you can uh, take part in that series on your own, or if you have a support person or care partner that you want to join in on that conversation with you, we we recommend that. It's a seven-week program, and uh, we just wrapped up our our um, winter program uh, this week on Wednesday, and we had excellent, excellent discussions around all of the topics that we talk about in these education series here. 
So it's a nice complement to what you learn about here. We just take a deeper dive and find ways to make that actually applicable to your, what you would like to do to continue living your best life. So uh, there is no cost to take part in that program. Um, there, if, you, if you have questions, just reach out to me specifically. Bonnie always has that information available to all of you. Our next class will be starting on October 5th. So we already have some folks registered for that. So if you're interested, please give me a call and, and we'll get you signed up. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, we have recorded today's program. We do edit out all of your pictures. Uh, so for the recording to be available, it usually takes about a month for our communications team um, to be able to uh, edit and do everything we need to do to then post it on our um, website. So we have that available. I will send a um, email to everybody who attended today that has uh, the slides and the information talked about and more information about living well with chronic conditions along with the websites that Kim linked in her um, PowerPoint today. So we can all have that information. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I uh, hope you guys have a happy spring and a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye everyone.